I was going to... I was going to get down there and preach like Carrie was just a second ago, but I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to get back up. I'd be down there for the rest of the day. I want to tell you a little bit about where I come from. I'm Comanche, Kiowa, and Cherokee. My dad was a full-blood Cherokee man. My mom was half Comanche, half Kiowa. I grew up mostly knowing my Comanche side because my grandpa, who married the Comanche woman, was disowned by his family because at that time, Kiowas and Comanches didn't get along. And so I'm on the Comanche roll, I'm half Cherokee, and my last name is Kiowa. So that's a little bit of the background right there where I come from. And I grew up mostly with my grandparents. I grew up in what I call the old, old school. Back when people really got spankings. You remember that? I mean, now they do time out and things like that. Time out is a result of my prayers while I was getting a whipping, amen? I prayed for a time where I could just sit in a corner and just think about what I did wrong. In the middle of those whippings, I hoped for a time. You know, there was a time when, you know, nowadays kids, they'll try to call 911 on their parents. You couldn't dial 911 back in the old days. Remember that? You had a rotor dial telephone. By the time that nine made it back around, you was already whipped, amen? I mean, you were done. You didn't want to talk to anybody. And so I had a grandma, my grandma, Jessie, this old Comanche woman. She was actually my great grandma. I lived with her for a little while. And she was always about home remedies. She'd say, son, we don't, we don't need that medicine. Grandma's got medicine. And so her medicine, Vicks mentholatum. Vicks mentholatum. It was the cure-all. I know some of you believe in it because I smelled it on the way in. There's some Vicks in this house this morning. I know it. I'm, I, it almost takes me to a flashback, really. And I'll tell you about why in just a minute. But it fixed everything. It didn't matter what was wrong. It was Vicks. And she always had the big old jar of Vicks. There wasn't the little economy size bar of Vicks. It was the big old vat. I call it a big old barrel of Vicks mentholatum. And just didn't even, have a, didn't even have a label on it anymore. Just used it so much. And so it was our cure in our house for the sore throat. Have you ever had your throat poked before? She said, I got some Indian medicine for that sore throat, son. So what my grandma would do, if we had a sore throat and we tried to hide it as long as we possibly could, okay? Because we didn't want to get our throat poked. Sometimes we would lie on somebody, tell grandma, Lonnie, he's got a sore throat, you better poke it. And he didn't have a sore throat one, but we wanted to get him gagging. You know what I mean? And so what my grandma would do, in case you don't know what this is, my grandma, she would take the victim and she would grab him about the mouth like this, okay? And I don't know how many of you are fishermen or not, you've been fishing, but you know, if you grab a bass by the mouth just right, he's just helpless and paralyzed. That's how my grandma would hold you. She'd just grab you about the mouth and you'd just be helpless and paralyzed. Your mouth would just be wide open. Then she would take the longest finger that I've ever seen in my life. It almost just seemed to protract right out of her head. It was the longest finger I'd ever seen. And she would take that long finger and she would dip it into that Vicks mentholatum. And while she was holding your mouth, she would take that finger literally and she would force it down your throat. Force it down your throat. And because she didn't know which part was sore, she would just go all the way around. And she would just take her time. She'd sing a little Comanche song while she was doing it. The whole time you're just gagging, wanting some air with somebody's finger in your throat, right? And so we hated that. We absolutely hated it. And as I got older, I tried to reason with my grandma. I say, Grandma, look, it's, it's the box right here. The box it says on it. It says external use only. (laughs) See, Grandma, that means only on the outside. External use only. She'd knock that box, literally knock that box out of my hand, and she'd put her finger right up on my chest, and she said, boy, that's for white people. (laughs) I said, I want to be white. I don't want to be Indian no more. I want to be white. I don't want that finger. But here's the deal. Here's the absolute. I, I know some of you are familiar with that tactic. You were shaking your head. You were having a flashback, just like I was. The crazy thing about that old remedy is that although it was painful and although it was ridiculous in my mind, it always worked. It always worked. I would like for you to open your Bibles to Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. And this morning we may walk through some things that are a little bit painful or a little bit uncomfortable, 
But I will tell you that God's remedies, God's cures always work. I believe with all of my heart as I've sat through this conference this week and I've listened to speaker after speaker and I've endured this time of worship where God's presence just comes and falls on us. It's not just a blessed time. It's also somewhat of a convicting time. Amen? Because when the presence of God falls on a place, there's an honesty between us and God that has to take place. If we're really going to experience his presence, if we're really going to take advantage of that moment when God falls on a place, there has to be this incredible honesty. And when we're in the presence of God, his holiness demands that we deal with those places in our hearts that are ugly or distant from him. And so it has been a wonderful time, but it has been a challenging time. Listening to God's word presented, entering into these times of worship, and the scripture says that he inhabits the praise of his people, and I believe we have been in the presence of the Lord. And so it has been a house cleaning time for me these few days. It's been a little bit uncomfortable, but I know that God's remedy is the best, and I know that it always works. And so I get to go home recharged and renewed And ready to take on whatever it is the Lord has for me. In Judges chapter 2, we find out some interesting things. First, we hear about a great generation. And then we hear the story of the next generation. That would be what I consider the tragic generation. In this first generation, you'll see in Judges chapter 2, starting in verse 6, here's where it talks about them. It says, after Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. And the people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. This is an incredible generation. When you look back and you see what this generation saw and you look back and you see what this generation went through, this was the generation that didn't just get promised the promised land. Remember, this is the generation that got to see the promised land with their own eyes. This is the generation that got to see the great miracles of God. Not only they see the promised land, but they walked into the promised land for the very first time. They got to partake of this great promise that the Lord had been giving to their people. They saw it and they experienced it with their own eyes. It was also the generation that got to see the fall of those great walls in Jericho. Literally watching these great walls fall. This is the generation that saw many great victories when defeat looked imminent. This was the generation that literally gets to see and watch as the sun stands still. This generation had seen lots and lots of great things. This was what I would consider a powerful and strong generation. But then we have the next generation. In verse 8 it says, Joshua son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the land of his inheritance. And step to verse 10 it says, and after that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, listen to this. It says, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. And then, listen to what happens to them. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers who had brought them out of Egypt, and they followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound and look like the generation that you have right now in front of you? It's that generation right now, if you even wanted to start with with youth ministry all the way up into college age, that's that generation. This is a generation that lives amongst you that's biblically illiterate. Some are saying the most biblically illiterate generation ever, ever. In fact, there was a study that was done marking the last five generations. And it's interesting to note that we're in a very unique time in history right now because it is the first time in history that five generations have been alive at the same time. Did you know that? And so they're able to mark that fifth generation. Some say the greatest generation to ever live. And now the newest generation, the generation they call Generation IY. In that fifth generation... They say that was the core group of people. That was the generation that even if they didn't believe necessarily or have a sincere faith in God, 
They believed that there was a God. This was a generation that may not have read the Bible, but they respected and believed it. This was a generation that amongst believers, they did read the Bible. It was uncommon for a believer to not read the scriptures. This was a generation, some of your generation, devoted to the scriptures. And not only devoted to the scriptures, but the generation that had believed the truth that's in the scripture, that God's word is just perfect the way it is. It doesn't need additives. It doesn't need preservatives. It doesn't need my spin. It doesn't need my opinion. God's word stands on its own. That was the mark of that fifth generation. And the statistics say that close to 85% of that generation, the generation of believers, held on to the truth of God and did their absolute best to live according to God's word. But the mark of history says that each generation began to lose that. And now, the generation, the young generation now, the IYs, if you were to take a guess at that same percentage under the same criteria, you would probably guess, thinking a little bit of diminishing of each generation, maybe some big jumps here and there, you'd probably guess this generation is somewhere around 25%, maybe 20%. Maybe you, some, of, some of you are really skeptical and you say, okay, maybe 10 or 15%. I will tell you this morning that this generation, this young generation, 4%. And listen, I didn't say 4% of the entire culture, the entire generation. I'm saying 4% of the church going, those who claim to be believers, 4% of this generation believe the Bible to be 100% true and valid enough to devote their lives to it. And folks, I will tell you that if that continues to be the case, then the scriptures will continue to live out this truth. Listen to it one more time. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grows up who neither knew the Lord nor anything that he had done for Israel. And then, this is what happens to them. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord, served the Baals, they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers who had brought them out of Egypt, and they followed and worshiped the various gods of the peoples around them. I've served in youth ministry for the last 20 years. It was only 15 months ago the Lord would call me into full-time evangelism. And it was with this burden in my heart that we have a generation that we have lost and are continuing to lose. We have a generation of young people now that's in terrible, terrible shape. They are chasing after other gods. They are chasing after the ways of the world. And it just seems like they're spinning relentlessly out of control. And folks, what I will tell you is if someone doesn't intervene, we will continue to see this magnified. And we'll see what we see in verse 14. Speaking of the Lord, in his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to their enemies all around whom they were no longer able to resist. And listen, whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them and not for them to defeat them. And just as he had sworn over them, listen to this, it says they were in great distress. You have a young generation in front of you and I think you would agree that is in great distress. And I wanna have the opportunity to tell you this morning, before I forget or before I pass on from this time with you, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for your faithful servant. Because you were the ones that instilled strong family. If I were to take a poll this morning and I were to ask you, who's been married for 30 years or 40 years, we would have people stand up in my church, Southern Hills Baptist Church in Oklahoma City. We used to have this deal where every Sunday we would recognize anniversaries. And I was just sitting there when I first got to the church, my wife and I had only been married for seven years and we thought that was a long time. And our first Sunday, they start having these anniversaries and they have the people stand up. And I'm looking at these senior adults and they're recognizing these big anniversaries. And I'm hearing 30 years. I'm thinking, wow, that's a long time. And it's almost, it seemed like it was a competition. Then somebody stand up 40 years. And then somebody would stand up 50 years. And I've seen some that have been 60 years. And there's some of you out there going, I could beat that. But your generation loved family. Your generation 
loved faithfulness. Your generation said, we will see this all the way through the end. When you made a covenant promise, you made it according to the scriptures and you said it was forever and you lived it. And I thank you for that. That is a huge accomplishment. Family. Do you remember how important family used to be? Amen? Do you remember that? With every generation since yours, it's diminished. It's disappeared. My generation, Generation X, probably the most selfish generation of all time. We were the generation that made divorce comfortable. And the generation after us, the generation that reaped the whirlwind of our selfishness. And this breeds into the generation Y and IY generation. And they're the generation that when you speak with most senior adults are the generation that you're almost done with (laughs) because you see the problems. You see, this is a generation where family appears like it's not important, but that's not the truth. The fact is it's very important to them. I'll share that with you in a minute. But it appears like they know everything. (laughs) You've never met anybody like that. They're the generation that's trying to change everything and mess everything up. They're the generation that doesn't want any help. That's what it appears like. But that's not the truth. The truth is that this generation, this young generation, the I wise or the wise, the reason why they act that way is because they're a wounded generation. They're a generation that's been abandoned by their parents. They're a generation that has been literally raised by technology, raised by the internet, raised by media. All of their values have not come from the scriptures. It comes from what they watch and what they listen to. And so on the outside, it looks like they're very distant. From the outside, it looks like they don't want anything to do with people like you. But folks, that is the exact opposite. In fact, studies have been done over and over and over again with this generation. And here's what they say. Here's what the studies say about this generation. It says they are the generation that wants to bring the family back. It's the generation, you may experience this, you may have seen this in your churches, but it's the generation where kids come from families that are dysfunctional or messed up. They will go out, find a family that's strong and they will adopt that family whether the family likes it or not. They'll spend time at their house. They'll spend multiple days at their house. They'll find a way to get adopted by a family. They want family. And the goal and the dream of their heart is to one day have a family. You see, they want to have what they didn't get. The reason why they seem distant is because they're wounded. This is the generation that everybody looks at and says, well, they're not teachable. Folks, that is not the truth. The truth is the mark of this generation, one of the huge marks is that they they, they are very much teachable. They want to learn. This is the generation because of the selfishness of my generation. They never learned how to fish. They never learned how to hunt. They don't know how to change their own oil. They can't even fix a flat. This is a generation that had nobody investing in them for anything. That's why they turned to the internet. That's why they paid so much attention to what was on TV. And the truth is, if you were to just get to an honest one-on-one conversation with this young generation, they would tell you, I want to learn. I really do want to learn. There are things that I want to know, but I don't know who to ask. I am so scared. They say that this generation, this young generation, is the most anxious generation. They worry about more things. They just have no idea how to cope with life. And I I watched your expressions a while ago and Carrie is amazing and she's sweet. And she said, you know, I'm 30 years old and I've been through some life stuff. I saw some of your faces. Oh, that's sweet. (laughs) You've been through about a third of what I've been through. I know where you come from, didn't experience it all, but I can look back and see, you guys know what it is to go through hard times. You know what it is to have to make adjustments on the fly. You know how it is. You've been through the hardest times in American history and you made it. And you're looking at a generation that has no idea how to cope. That's why right now suicide is at an all time high amongst that generation. They don't know how to cope with just day-to-day stress of life. Nobody has invested in them. They say this generation is the most genuine generation. That it's the generation that knows how to spot a phony. 
and will attach loyally to someone who is genuine. And they will learn from someone who is genuine. They will only not be teachable when they encounter people that are not the real deal. So why do I share all of this information with you? Because when I look in Judges and I see this generation that is about to be destroyed, this generation that has no good ending in sight, I see what the Lord did for this generation. When you skip on over to chapter 3 and you look at verse 7, he reminds us the state of the people. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. And listen to what it says in verse 9. This is amazing. And this is what I plead with you this morning for. He says, but when they cried out to the Lord, listen to this, he raised for them a deliverer, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. <laughs> and the spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge. And he says this, I love this. And he says, and he went to war. God saw the distress of his people. He saw the distress of that generation. And you know what God did? He raised up a warrior. He raised up a man, Othniel. And it says of Othniel that he took on, he took on this picture. He took on this problem. And it says of him that he went to war. And what I want to share with you, there is a harvest before you. There is a harvest of young people who need you, who need your experience, who need your mentoring, who need you to build and, and, and live in them, who needs to teach them. There are young moms that need to know how to be a mom and they're hungry to learn how to be a mom. There are women out there, young women, that are wanting to know what it means to be a godly wife. And you have it. You have so much to offer them. And my challenge to you, this, this going after this new harvest, my heart for you and what God has placed on my heart for you is that you would leave this place not seeing yourselves as senior adults, not seeing you yourselves as, as someone that's close to the finish line, but to leave this place saying, you know what, as God has me here, I have a mission, I have a ministry. And not to look at a young generation and say they are in a lot of trouble, but to say and look at that generation, I'm going to go to war for them. I will find young people. I'll find young couples. I'll find people who need a grandpa or a grandma. I'll teach them how to fish. I'll give them advice on life. I'll let them know that when that girl breaks up with them, it's not the end of the world. I'll let them know that somebody cares about them, that somebody loves them. And more than that, I'm going to teach them what God's word has done in my life and how God's word has shaped me and how God's word has gotten me through. I'm going to teach them the value of scripture. I'm going to model for them a godly life. You have the opportunity to be there off now. But you have to leave this place with a heart that says, I'm ready to go to war for them. Because they are worth fighting for. Sociologists tell us that good or bad, this generation Y, this generation IY, is likely to have the greatest impact on the entire planet than any other generation. You say, how so? They're the largest generation ever to walk the planet. There's more of them than any other generation, including the boomers. They're also the most connected generation in the world. Did you know right now, if you take Facebook, and all the people that do Facebook, if you don't know what Facebook is, just hear me out. But if you take Facebook and you combine all the people around the world on it, it becomes the third largest country in the world. When you look at the political uprisings that happened in Egypt, a lot of it was networked through Facebook and other social networking. This generation is going to be powerful. This generation is going to be influential. The problem is we just don't know what direction it's going to go. 
and someone has to fight for them. And I believe it's your generation. As a youth pastor for 20 years, I did a lot of things wrong and a few things right. But one thing that I see very clearly after working with teenagers for that long is that they need you. They need you. They need you. And my heart is that you would go home and you would go to war for them. Father God, I come to you. And Lord, I love you with all of my heart. I do. And I'm thankful for your word and I'm thankful for the power of it. And Lord, I'm thankful for these men and these women that are here. Lord, and for the, for the years of experience, the years of life. Lord, for the, the men and women of God and what you've done to make them that. Lord, we have a generation in front of us that's in trouble. But God, I believe this is the generation that can win them. That can show them the strength of family. That show them the strength of faithfulness to a spouse. That show them devotion to your word. That show them devotion to you. And Lord, I pray that you would put that burden on their heart. Lord, I pray they wouldn't be able to quit thinking about it. Lord, I pray that already in their minds, they're thinking of young couples that have come across their path or, or young children that have come across their path. Lord, even that, that hard head that gets on their nerve at church. That God, you would already give them visions and dreams of how to reach these younger generations. Lord, I pray that for some of the women here, they would think in their hearts and their minds right now of, of a young mom, a young wife, that they could mentor, they could pour into, they could pray for, they could just check on. And Lord, I pray you do the same thing for the men, that you'd put in their hearts and mind pictures of young husbands, young dads, young boys that could use their influence and Lord, give them a heart that will go to war. You watch over them, keep them. Give them strength where they need strength, Father. Take away fears and anxieties. And God, use them. Use them, Father. In your name I pray. Amen. Bless you.